Hi, I'm 29 years old, and all I've ever known is growing up is that in the world we've got problems, quite big problems, problems which if we don't solve them will turn into disaster. For instance, we've got antibiotic resistance. We're all losing the fight against bacteria which makes up, make us ill, and I think that's scary stuff. If you look at the way we produce our food, it's not sustainable. We can't be doing this in 40 years' time. We won't have any food left, so we need to change. We need to come up with solutions for, for these kind of problems. And actually, it's the same with, with drinking water. If we don't change, drinking water will run out, and I think that's scary stuff. Well, as a little kid, that's yeah, cute, right? As a little kid, I always thought that that the world would be changed, we would solve these things in these kind of rooms, in boardrooms, and people would come up with strategies and policies and they would, they would change the world and they would come up with solutions. But now I'm 29 and I don't believe that anymore. I think actually individuals, small groups can make a change. And actually at some point they're, they're better at it than the guys in these rooms because they've got freedom. If you're an individual, you've got freedom, and I think freedom is a, is a powerful thing if you want to solve a problem. Now, I'm a biologist, and during my studies in biology, I figured, hey, let's do something with, with my knowledge and change the problem and solve it. So I started looking for problems, actually. So I went to a lot of people and I asked them, like, what's your profession, what do you, what do, you do all day, and, 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 and do you have any issues? And people have loads of issues. Um, and I went to a chicken farmer, and he gave me an issue which I've been working on for the last three years. It's this, it's, it's quite simple. Chickens lay eggs. That's easy, right? That's what you get taught in kindergarten. Well, not really, because half of them actually don't. They're males. Male chickens don't lay, lay any eggs, right? So what do we do with them? After hatching, we separate them by hand. The females are sold, but the males are killed. Every year in the Netherlands, we kill 45 million of these chicks. In the European Union, it's, it's about 330 million, and worldwide, we kill 3.2 billion chicks. These chicks. You could fill the hall easily with those chicks, and then some. Now, I came up with a solution. What if we don't genotype the chick? What if we genotype the egg? It's easy, right? That means that we don't have to kill male chicks, Efficiency goes up and we make money. That's, that, that's a great combination, right? Well, when I first started this, I was a poor student. I had nothing, literally nothing. But that was fantastic, actually, because I had freedom. I could do whatever I wanted. No one was telling me what to do. I could talk to anyone and think of if the chicken, for, uh, chicken sector. It's highly polarized. If you guys are in a supermarket, you have to buy eggs, you either go for the dark side or you go for the good side. If you go for the dark side, you don't pay that much, but you also know kind of that the chicken didn't have that, that much of a nice life, right? But if you go for the good side, you pay more and the chicken has a great life. That's your choice. Well, I didn't make that choice at all. I was an observer, I was objective, I was the third person in the room. And I could talk to anyone. And everyone would like to talk to me. And I analyzed. And it says, Voltaire said it, no problem can stand the assault of sustained thinking. It's true, and if you're free, you can think better than anyone else. And what happened is, I could talk to people from animal welfare organizations, from, from, I could talk to chicken farmers, I could talk to the government, and you know what I found out? Everyone wanted to get rid of this problem. Everyone. And they started helping out. And what happened actually is that I set up a company and um, we went from this small idea to a company. We now have all kinds of partnerships with people from, from all over. They want to get rid of this. And together we're actually solving this issue now. And in two years time, together with my, with my partner Will, we will put these devices in every hatchery in the Netherlands and preferably the world. We want to solve this issue and we're, we're having a, a company which is going to produce a lot more of these technologies which Combine animal welfare uh, and, and efficiency improvements, improvements, both at the same time. Now, two years ago, I started my second project, which is based all around Arduino. 
Well, Arduino is an electrical circuit for, for dummies. So I'm a biologist, so I'm, I'm an electrical dummy, right? And you can plug in all kinds of stuff, so LEDs and sensors and motors, and you can create your own hardware. It's pretty cool. It's pretty nice. It's kind of nerdy, but it's pretty cool. So what we did, actually, I, with, together with Peter and Jelmer, we spent a lot of evenings at Peter's kitchen table, and we started messing around with Arduino, and we, we made a LED blink. Now, if you do that, it's pretty cool. It, it, it feels pretty cool. It sounds pretty dull, but... <laughs> then then we, we, we made sure we could control the lights in Peter's house with a phone. It's pretty cool. And then we made a Star Wars cat door. So if the cat enters the door, it plays Imperial March. <laughs> now that's a marvel of innovation, right? And we were playing, and it was fun, and we were, it was cool. It was ni nice evenings. We spent <laughs> hours and hours at, at this kitchen table. But at some point, we decided we wanted to do something serious. And our background is in biology, so what we did is we mimicked the device from the lab. Actually, in hospitals all around the world, we have this device which checks your blood for pathogens, for illnesses. So if you've sent your blood to a lab, it probably ended up in a machine like this. And it's used to detect whether you're ill or not. Now, normally this runs in, in hospitals uh, with, with people in lab coats and it's sterile and stuff, but we wanted to have one at the kitchen table. So what we did, we went to Home Depot. We got tubes, we got a hair dryer, because the core of this technology is heating and cooling. And we got it together, and the cool thing is, I tested it in the lab, and it was working. And that was kind of cool, because for 40 euros, we had a device like that. Of course, it doesn't look that good, so we, we actually made it a lot more fancy. We put it in a shoebox. <laughs> and that shoebox, we took to a lot of people, and we started asking, like, what would you do with a 40 euro costing device like this? How would you use it? And actually, at some point, we went to the LUMC, the, the, the medical center in Leiden, and the people there said, well, what if we take the device and we take it from the hospital here and we put it in the field in developing countries? It would be awesome to use this device to detect malaria in patients. Now, for those of you who don't know, malaria is a terrible illness. It kills 500,000 people a year. Millions get ill because of it. And we're in the fight against malaria, right? But we've got so many issues, and one of the issues is diagnostics. So in healthcare, diagnostics is, is a pretty big deal because you want to know whether you're sick or not, and whether you want to get medicine or not. And the, the current diagnostic methods in the field are great for a lot of people, but for some people, they don't work. So if you're pregnant, you don't have a lot, lot of parasites in the blood, so you'll never know, they can never detect whether there's malaria or not, and that's a big issue. People are dying because of that. And the technology, here, used in a hospital, is actually very sensitive. So we, we got on track with that. We said, okay, what if we use the technology, bring it to the field, can we actually save lives with it? And we went to a fabrication lab. We were excited, right? Went to a fabrication lab. We used 3D printing and laser cutting and, and Arduino, like I just... And what happened is, we build a prototype, another prototype, and another prototype, and this is the latest prototype. It's the device in a suitcase, battery powered, you can take it with you, and this is actually a device which we're gonna test in Zambia. And we're gonna show that this device is superior in sensitivity to the current methods, and we're gonna show that this is actually a great way to diagnose malaria. So we went from this kitchen table, Star Wars thing, and we went, we're going to go into the field now. So a year ago, I was phoned by a dear friend of mine, Eric. And Eric wanted to get married. And he had his girlfriend, so. Um, <laughs> and he phoned me and he said, okay, I, I, I really want to get married to this girl and I, I really liked her, so uh, what he wanted to do is he wanna, wanted to go out for dinner. And when he went out for dinner, I, I would come to, into his house and I put some candles there so when, when he got back, he could propose to his girlfriend. So it was the evening and the text messaged me. He says, okay, I'm gonna, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna propose and you get into the house and put some candles. So I snuck in and they were out for dinner. I, I put candles there, but not 20. No, I put the whole house full of candles. And I put chocolates and, and champagne and roses because I wanted this to happen, right? Well, long story short, they got married. They're a happy couple now. 
Um, but my point is that when he asked me, I didn't think twice. I was like, this is going to cost me money or this is going to cost me time or whatever. I'm going to support this guy because I like the cause, right? Well, in my companies, in my projects, I have had so many people do the same thing for me. Literally hundreds of people just chipped in a bit of their hours, a bit of their time, and it made such a difference. It helped me break through a lot of problems. Now, that's powerful, right? If we can channel that as a society, if we can, can all chip in a bit, a bit of our hours, it's not going to hurt you, right? And it might help push these solutions forward. What I would really love is that we start telling these kids who grew up with these problems, and they know, if you're 10, you know that these problems are around, that they can solve them themselves. They don't have to wait for the boardroom, they can do it themselves. I want us to boost the tools to do so, the 3D printing and whatever, just to, to give them the tools to do so on the kitchen table. I want us to put in our hours, not 20 candles, not, not 200, I want, I want millions of candles, right? If we can do that, and if we can give these kids freedom, I'm pretty sure that we'll create an army of, of guerrilla innovators, which solve our problems. That's the world I want to live in. I, 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 I really want to ask you to join me in that world. Thank you.